When America was founded, she was strong and pure and good. And her leaders on their knees were not ashamed to call on God. That's right. But our nation in her pride has turned her back upon the right. And the clouds of evil threaten to turn glory into night. Strong wickedness has crept in like a cold and bloody thief. Those who know the Lord and do his word stand by in disbelief. For the love of God and country, we must not cease for a day. Right. For the future of our children, we must lift our hearts and pray. Turn the tide, Lord, turn the tide. Open wide the floodgates of your power. Restore, revive, and bless. Restore. Turn the tide. God's enemy is hard at work, undermining everywhere, breaking down foundations, True. twisting laws, and setting snares. He would take away our freedom and replace it with despair. And he laughs at those opposing him as if they were not there. But God's children cannot sit by. We must stand up and defend. For the battle is not over till our king declares the end. We must work and fight and meet him, not as those who beat the air. For the greatest weapon in our hands is strong and fervent prayer. Turn the tide, Lord, turn the tide. Open wide the floodgates of your power. Stem the flood of wickedness. Restore, revive, and bless. Turn the tide. Now the waves of immorality, they beat upon our shore. And it seems that all ungodliness is knocking at our door. We must never give up hope. We must not let them win the war. We will plead with him who has the power to cleanse and to restore. Amen. Restore, turn the tide, Amen. turn the tide. Open wide the floodgates of your power. Stem the flood of wickedness. Restore, revive, and bless. Turn the tide. Stem the flood of wickedness. Yes, Restore, revive, and bless. Turn the tide. Well, thank you, Miss Ashley. Now, find your music, that song that we gave out in the preacher's meeting. And if you don't have one, we've got them back there on that stand. Hold your music up. Let's see if you got your music. Did, oh, a bunch of you did get your music. Good. Well, we've been learning it here. Let me sing. Let me just sing one verse of it for everybody, and then we'll try it, because many of you tonight, you've not heard the song at all. It goes like this. Look at your music and listen. 
I want my life to count for Christ in all I do and say. Help me, dear Lord, to search for your will and live for you every day. Give me a vision, dear Lord, for the lost. Use me to show them the way. For souls lost in darkness need Jesus the Lord. Oh, give me a vision, I pray. So the song is a prayer. It starts with a testimony. I want my life to count for Christ. Isn't that what you want? Amen. That's what we want. Everybody try it with me. Ready? Uh, I want my life to count for Christ in all I do and say. Help me, dear Lord, to search for your will and live for you every day. Give me a vision, dear Lord, for the lost. Use me to show them the way. For souls lost in darkness need Jesus the Lord. Oh, give me a vision, I pray. If in this world a sparrow falls, my Father has it planned. Much greater still the care God bestows to us from His gracious hand. <laughs> Give me a vision, dear Lord, for the lost. Use me to show them the way. For souls lost in darkness need Jesus the Lord. Oh, give me a vision, I pray. It is God's will for all to come. To Christ who loves them so. Oh, may I share the gospel today that Jesus grace they may know. Give me a vision, dear Lord, for the lost. Use me to show them the way. Souls lost in darkness need Jesus the Lord. Oh, give me a vision, I pray. Praise the Lord. If you would, put the song away. We sing it every service here. And all of you preachers with the I-B-F-A, Independent Baptist Friends of a of America and Alabama. <laughs> um, you can take that back to your church, make copies, teach it to your people. Normally, it's a big copyright infringement to make uh, illegal copies, but I'm giving permission to everybody for that song to make as many copies as you can use. Amen. The only thing you can't do is start... Uh, selling it. Don't do that. <laughs> You're allowed to make it and uh, give those away. Let's turn in the Bible to the book of Matthew. The book of Matthew chapter 5. You would turn there with me please. We had a great couple hours next door with the uh, preachers tonight. And uh, we're so glad they're here at Grace Baptist tonight. Praise God for Grace Baptist Church. Amen to that. And Pastor, you're doing a good job. And he and I got to make some visits today. And we always want to be busy spreading the gospel a little bit every single day. And uh, we don't want to just talk about it. We want to actually do that. And the children in the service, I'm glad for kids. Praise the Lord for these children. They're so well behaved. And uh, we commend their parents for how they're raising uh, their children, rearing their children. We thank God for it. 
And uh, we thank the Lord Jesus. Without Him, there wouldn't be a reason to meet. But we serve a risen Savior tonight. And we're glad about that. Everybody in the building, thank you for being here. And those watching, we wish you were here with us, but we understand. And uh, we hope it won't be long that you will join us right inside this building and get our choir back going, all these good things. Um, I do want to mention the CDs. At the back table, right over here, there's some CDs. And uh, we've got the brand new one for children, Bible Stories for Kids, Volume 3. And you can get quantities of these for your church if you wish. John Wilkerson got 2,000 of these for all the bus kids there at First Baptist in Hammond. I'm glad of that. And Mike Norris got 1,000 of these there at Franklin Road Baptist Church. And so get, get some, 50 for your people, 25, 100, whatever you need. I've got about, uh, I've probably got about 100 of this one with me. But uh, I know where several thousand are. Uh, man, big news at Bible Truth Music. For 33 years... For 33 years, I have personally supervised all of the order fulfillment. For 33 years, millions of pieces of music going out. I've got two more weeks to supervise. Hallelujah. We shipped 86,000 pounds of music to Illinois. And my, my, uh, my general manager, 28 years old, it's his turn. Hallelujah. <laughs> I'm just about to get relieved, you know what I'm saying? It's been quite a chore and a happy chore for the Lord through all these years to keep the music in good shape and organized. That's a lot of music, friends. We had about 175,000 pieces of music that we put on those trailers and we kept just enough to keep orders uh, being fulfilled for about one month. And they've just about got it all organized. They've got about a week and it's their turn. Hallelujah. I feel better already. <laughs> so many mornings at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, everybody else going home and Brother Fox still packing music, you know. And uh, we're glad to serve all the churches. And uh, we're, we're thankful to the Lord for all of that. Well, let's get in our Bible, may we? The CDs are any size donation. I really mean that. Uh, whatever you wish to give to Bible Truth Music, help us keep going to continually get out new music. We want to do that, and there's a variety back there, including some Christmas music. It's not long till Christmas. Now, Matthew chapter 5. In my copy of the Bible, it says the Beatitudes. And <coughs> this is Jesus Christ, the greatest preacher of all time. I've got favorite preachers, all that. But the greatest preacher ever is Jesus, and he's going to preach in this passage. Uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 1. Seeing the multitudes, he, Jesus Christ, went up into a mountain, and when he was set... His disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst, thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. And then verse 8 says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. <laughs> Rejoice and be exceeding glad for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Our text tonight is verse 8. Let's read it together, may we? Verse 8, ready, begin. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. The pure in heart. The pure in heart. In the Bible, the heart is not merely a physical organ. All of us have a heart tonight. I uh, hope <laughs> that's working, but it's more than just a bodily organ. Uh, I've heard preachers describe it this way. It's said to be the seat of the emotions uh, out of your heart is where love comes. Out of your heart is where fear comes. Courage, anger, joy, hatred. All those things come out of the heart of a person. And Jesus in verse 8 said, Blessed are the pure in heart. 
Now, what does that mean? Well, we ought to take it for exactly what it says. Blessed are the pure in heart. Our love toward God ought to be pure. Amen. Our motives. What's causing you to do what you're doing? What is it that's motivating you? I hope it's a pure motive. What do you have a desire for? What are your aspirations right now? Well, what is it that, uh, that you want? It ought to be something that's pure and wholesome and right. Amen to that. Uh, well, now, does that, does that mean, being pure in heart, does that mean you, you just can't enjoy life? Well, no, the pure in heart enjoy life more than anybody else. Real joy comes from being pure. Joy is the fruit of the Spirit. Now, does it mean being pure in heart? So with all them Christians, they're trying to be pure in heart. That means they walk around with straight jackets on. They look pious and they retreat off into seclusion. No, that's not what it means. No, Christians have a great time. Amen to that. The joy of the Lord is my strength. That's what the servant of the Lord said. Now, in Matthew 23, the Pharisees, they tried to gain favor with God with their little made-up rituals and so forth and they made clean the outside of the cup, Jesus said. You made the outside clean, but on the inside, it's full of dead men's bones, Jesus said. So you, uh, you Pharisees, with all your religious rites, and uh, trying to keep the letter of the law, giving tithe even on your spices, upon your mint. And, uh, but the Lord said, I look on the heart. And you've been working from the outside in. God says you ought to work from the inside out. Start with a pure heart. A pure heart. See, the Lord Jesus taught that God looks deeper than just the outside of a person. God looks on the heart. God searches the heart, the Bible says. He knows my motives. He knows my thoughts. He knows my intents. Uh, I was thinking back, getting ready for tonight. I was thinking back. I was thinking we'd have some children here. And I was thinking back. Oh, I thought back. Way, way back. Over 50 years ago, I thought back. Whoo, I was thinking way back yonder. Yonder, that's a good country term. Yeah, I was a little boy. And I somehow woke up before anybody else in the family woke up. And I decided I'd surprise my whole family. I'd make breakfast. Yeah. So I went in the kitchen. Nobody else is up. And here I am. I'm a little boy. I'm going to make breakfast. I decided I'd make some toast first off. Boy, I put a lot of butter on it because I wanted it to be good toast. I put, I made several pieces, and I put it on that pan, and I put it inside that oven. I turned that oven on, and I was looking around the kitchen trying to figure out what else I was going to make, and I guess it took me quite some time because suddenly there's a lot of smoke in the kitchen. Whoo! I mean, that toast was catching on fire, man. And at that point, with all the smoke inside the house, my dad woke up. And man, he thought the house was on fire. <laughs> he came charging in there, and boy, I mean, he was alarmed. All the smoke in the house, I was just, and he found out his little boy was trying to make breakfast. And I mean, the house got pretty wound up pretty fast. You know, when you think the house is burning down, uh, the, whole, the whole household wakes up. Turns out little Byron's there making breakfast. That was the worst looking toast you've ever seen in your life. I was a little boy, and all that excitement, I'd failed, and I'd been trying to do something good for my family, and it was a mess. It was a complete disaster. My dad sat down, and he got out some jelly and put it on the least burnt. <laughs> it was awful. And he ate that toast. He looked at my heart that I wanted to do something good. I was a complete failure. You know, how successful are any of us compared to God who's perfect? We had all this congregational singing. And I'll tell you, Pastor Pack, you did a good job leading this congregational singing. 
Now, how many of us in this room sang every note perfect? Uh, probably not any of us. Did anybody come in too early? Probably so. Held on too late? Probably so. Sang a wrong note or two or five? Yeah, probably so. Sang some wrong words, singing the verse three when he's only on verse two. We've done all that stuff. Uh, man, uh, uh, even on our, at our best, we're not very good, and yet God, when He sees us doing our dead level best for Him, He's pleased. Amen. When our hearts are pure, when our motivation is pure, when we give our best to God, He's pleased. If we do very good and it's not our best, God's not pleased with that. He knows our intents. He knows our heart. God looks on the heart. Here's what the Bible says, Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Jesus in Mark chapter 7, Jesus taught that the heart was far from God. The unbelievers. Unbelief is such a terrible sin. Take you straight to hell. That unbelieving heart, the blind heart, the proud heart, pride separates man from God. Pride shuts the door on fellowship with God. That proud heart, stubborn, obdurate, rebellious heart, full of idolatry, Jesus said in Mark 7. I was reading some time back about this young man who had, had just went on a crime spree in New York. And he was arrested and, and he was up on trial and because of vicious murders, murders that he had committed. And I was reading that uh, at the trial, his mama made this statement. I wrote it down. His mama said, But he is a good boy! No, ma'am, he's not. No, he's not a good boy. His heart is unregenerated. And it's led him to all of his crime. And he's been very wicked. We sometimes make those statements, don't we? Uh, think about history. I was just thinking about history. Think about all the peace treaties that have been made. All the peace treaties between this country and that country. We're going to make peace. Going to make peace. How many peace treaties have been broken? Every one of them. Why? Because man's heart is desperately wicked and broken all the peace treaties. And uh, how many people have died on the battlefields thinking about these men who served? How many men have died on the battlefield because of wicked aspirations of people? The heart is desperately wicked. Jesus said, if you want my blessings, blessed are the pure in heart. No one will ever be supremely happy and satisfied with their life until their hearts are pure, <laughs> been made pure. So uh, now how does the world go about trying to get pure hearts? Ah, the world's, the politicians and the world systems and the educational systems, they, uh, the world says we've got the solution on how to, how to fix people. Uh, the, their solution, the world's solution is Put a man in a wholesome atmosphere and he'll turn out good. The world says that a person's environment is what causes them to be good or bad. If we can get them to have right mental attitudes, if, uh, if we can just give them the right education, then everything will turn out good. It's just not true. It's not true. I'm from Virginia. And in Virginia, we think somehow if we just educate our criminals, if we'll just educate them, that I mean, this guy that stole the watermelon and we put him in jail, if we'll just educate him, man, that'll make all the difference. And so we educate him there in the jail and we let him out and the man who stole the watermelon, next time he, uh, he steals the truck with all the watermelons on it because now he's just an educated thief. He's still a thief. No, it's not just a matter of uh, education. I got thinking about over at the bookstores, all the self-help sections. Man, that's the rage in America. Uh, we, we just got to have some self-help. 
I don't even like that term. Self, we need God's help, ladies and gentlemen. Self-help, self-help, self. If you'll think happy thoughts, you'll turn out happy. That's what the world says. I'd rather stick with what Jesus said. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Ezekiel 36. <laughs> Ezekiel 36. Here's what God's Word says. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh. You see, this pure heart, it's a work of God. <laughs> it's not a work of man. Self-help, no, no, no. It's, it's God's help that we need. Purity of heart is a direct result of God at work in somebody's life. It's a direct result of being born again. It's a miracle. And everybody needs that miracle of salvation. Everybody needs that cleansed heart. That forgiven heart, that justified heart, justified just like you've never sinned. Man, when the Lord justifies a man, it's complete, friends. It's a pure heart. Uh, Webster. I like looking at Webster's Dictionary to figure out what words mean. What does purity mean? Well, Webster, he wrote it out this way. Purity means, quote, Freedom from dirt or foulness, cleanness. Freedom from guilt or defilement of sin. That's what it says. Innocence. Chastity. That's a good old-fashioned word. Chastity. Freedom from sinister or improper motives or views. You can tell that Webster knew God. That's a great definition of what purity is. And the Bible continually instructs His people. Yeah. The Bible continually says that we ought to be physically, mentally, and morally pure. Here's what the Bible says in 1 Peter 1 and verse 16. God says, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Uh, Psalm 24, verse 3 and 4. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in the holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart. That's who's going to stand there. Who hath not lifted his soul up unto falsehood, nor sw sworn deceitfully. Boy, that's a great passage in the Bible. So I've got a little, little outline for you tonight. And, um, oh man, it's already seven minutes till eight. Just relax. It's not going to be very long. Three little points. Number one, God wants us to be pure in body. God wants us to be pure in body. Now we joke. I even joked with somebody this week. Said, well, we take a bath every Saturday. <laughs> well, you know, it might do good to take a shower more than just on Saturdays. You know what I'm saying? And uh, there's no excuse for a Christian to walk around unclean and get, get you some deodorant and get some soap and water. Everybody can afford soap and water. But uh, being pure in body is more than that. That word chastity, that's a great word. Uh, here's what Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 3. This is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication. Amen to that. You turn on the news and it just tells all the time about all the immoral behavior of our country and unfaithfulness. How many homes are broken in Alabama because a man's been unfaithful? When a man commits that sin, oh my, it hurts the whole state. It hurts the whole country. It's a sin against God. It's a sin against his spouse. It's a sin against his children. It's a sin against his neighborhood. It's a sin against his church. It's a gross, awful sin. Unfaithfulness. Immorality. And now we've got perversion taking place. Perversion. Our land is full of it. Let me tell you something. God hates immorality. 
May we not forget that. God wants us to be pure in body. Our country's tried to put away the plain teaching of the Bible. Those Ten Commandments, they're fantastic. They used to be up in all of our government schools. When I was a boy, they had just taken them down. When I got in school, they had just taken the Ten Commandments down. But even when I was a boy, you didn't have to lock your bicycle up at school. Thou shalt not steal had been taught in the schools for so long that when I first went, you didn't have to have locks on your bicycle. Yeah, we rode our bicycle to school. You didn't have to put your lock. If you had a bicycle, finally in second grade I had one. It was a hand-me-down, 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 hand-me-down. I was fifth owner of that thing. Didn't have a bicycle seat. We just tied some rags on it. You knew you'd like to have a bicycle seat, but anyway. It wasn't all that stealing because of the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not commit adultery. That's what the Scriptures say. Need to be pure in body, pure in heart, pure in body. Impurity is everywhere in America today. There's a degradation of morals and there's an abandonment of God and there's broken homes and broken lives and there's corruption and there's guilt. And let's remember what God says. The wages of sin is death. The Bible clearly teaches that we're supposed to keep our bodies pure. Amen for the Bible. Amen for everything God has ever said. Number one, we need to keep our bodies pure. Number two, God wants all of Americans, all of the Alabama folk, keep a pure mind. Pure body, pure mind. Philippians 4 and verse 8, Whatsoever things are pure, think on these things. That scripture closes out with. Um, do you know that man can have... Uh, Evil imaginations. In fact, one time God destroyed the entire world because of it. That's what he says there in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5. God saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. The philosophies of man. Well, we've had some of the weirdest philosophies. You know during COVID and all that sort of stuff. I spent 26 straight days at home, preached from my dining room table, preaching two or three revivals at a time. I loved it. I preached with my suit on at that dining room table. Five minutes later, I was sitting over there in my easy chair eating ice cream. That was great, man. <laughs> I'm glad we're back together. Hallelujah. But during all that, I, I tried to read some of those philosophers. Rene Descartes, he doubted everything. One time in one of his speeches, he doubted he was even alive. Man, if you don't know if you're alive, I'm not reading any more of this book. Put that thing away, weirdo man. Rene Descartes, that French philosopher, that metaphysician. And you see, he doubted Jesus Christ was the Son of God. That's his big problem, you see. Get Spinoza out. Okay, old Spinoza, he's famous. No, when you leave God out, all these philosophers, it's just vain. It's all vanity. I just, I put it away, man. I don't, I don't, I don't need that stuff. I tried it. Nah. Uh, God is concerned with our imaginations, with our mind. Solomon said it this way, As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Robert Browning said, Thought is the soul of the act. You know where sin starts? In your mind. Then it gets down in your heart. And then it gets into your behavior. Emerson wrote, Thought is the seat of the action. It's true. God destroyed the entire world there in Genesis because of man's evil imaginations. Um, don't we know that God still grieved when our... Uh, thought life is so sinful with rampant sin constantly on people's minds today. All transgression begins with sinful thinking. And so we need God to cleanse our mind and then to keep our minds pure. Now you know there's a difference between your mind and the brain. 
There's a difference. The brain is like that piano, but the mind is like the pianist. Your brain never stops. Your brain, you go to sleep. You can turn your mind off for a while and go to sleep. But that brain is still working. And there are some folk who've trained their brain so well that they can solve problems during their sleep. It's amazing. God made an amazing brain. Everything God ever made is amazing. <laughs> amazing creation. And He just spoke it into existence. We were out there talking to somebody today. I reminded that gentleman that God spoke this whole universe. And <laughs> he did, when you have all power, it's not hard. <laughs> And uh, look, uh, only God can cleanse your mind and keep your mind pure. Job said it this way, Job 31.1, I made a covenant with my eyes. Don't we men in this room want to keep ourselves clean and pure and keep our minds pure? Better be like Job and make a covenant with your eyes. And then we need to make some covenants with our tongues. Should anybody in this room be heard cursing, using foul language, crude language? No, no, our speech ought to be pure. Our behavior ought to be pure. Our minds ought to be pure. Our tongues ought to be pure. Is modesty still right? Hallelujah for all the ladies in all of our churches. Hallelujah for all of our ladies who dress modestly. All of our ladies who want to keep themselves unspotted from the world, I say hallelujah, glory be to God. And um, I was helping a fellow out in Colorado. He's a Bible college graduate. He was running for council. And, and they began mocking him. They came up with a big scandal. Big scandal this year on him, on this preacher running for all. Big scandal. Yeah, his wife dressed modestly. They thought, how bizarre is that? <laughs> I sent him another um, uh, donation to his campaign. We want those kind of scandals, sir. Amen. May the Lord help you win. We want some more of that. They made fun of him because his wife dressed properly. Hallelujah. Our ladies ought to dress to please the Lord. And modesty, you can have good taste and still be modest. Amen to that. And the Hollywood look, may the Lord help us. Number one, ought to be pure in body. Number two, ought to be pure in our minds. And then number three, ought to be pure in our conduct. Pure in our conduct. Come out from among them and be ye separate. And touch not the unclean thing. That's what the scriptures say. So should all of God's people be honest? Hello? Amen. Oh, yeah. So you, you mean even on my income taxes? Yes, including on your income. Who, who wants to pay taxes? None of us. But we want to be honest because God is watching. And He's taking the accounting. Um, I sold a van some time back, several years ago. I sold a van, and I, I don't know, it had 253,000 miles on whatever it was. And uh, a preacher in Virginia, he was starting a church, and I didn't know the man. He came by my house and said, I'd like to buy that van. And I'd looked it up on Kelly Blue Book and the, uh, so forth. And the uh, vehicle, according to them, was worth $1,000. And so um, I said to the man, I said, according to this, it's $1,000. He said, well, I'm going to use this to pick up folk to come to church. And so I think I said, well, can you give seven fifty for it? He said, well, Sure. That was about August or September. At Christmas time, he sent me another $50. He said, I don't think I treated you fair. I, th I, th I think I, I should have given you more. When did you last see someone with that much honor? He didn't have to do that. But he wanted to make sure he hadn't cheated me. I wanted to make sure I wasn't cheating him. And then he turned around and said, I want to make sure I'm not cheating you. That's amazing, isn't it? Is that the way Christians ought to be? Hallelujah, it is. Completely honest in our conduct. Integrity in every way. Uh, you know what employers are looking for? They're looking for employees that will give an honest day's work. Honor. Honesty. Integrity. 
Jesus said, you want to get the Lord's blessings on your life? Amen. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Would you bow your heads? Well, just how pure is our heart tonight? Well, now if we're saved, we've got that uh, positional sanctification. Why don't you all just start making your way to the altars now that want to come and pray? Come on. Come on, all the men and women just want to come and pray and say, God, I want to have that pure heart you're talking about. I want your blessings on my family. I want your blessings on my life. Now, if you're not saved, that's the first order of business. You need to get saved. You need to be born again. How do you get born again? Jesus said, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. The Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Come every soul by sin oppressed, there is mercy with the Lord. That's the way the hymn writer wrote it, and it's true. If you need somebody to pray with you, just get somebody to pray. Rededicate yourself to God on a daily basis. God bless you. God bless you. Yes. Blessed are the pure in heart. Pure in body. Pure in mind. Pure in conduct. Let's commit our ways to the Lord. I can't be pure without God's help. Listen, my human flesh, the best of men are just men at best. We need the Lord, the touch of the Lord. Only God can cleanse us. We're wicked, we're vile. But now God can straighten a man out. God can. God can straighten a man out. But only God can do that. All of men's programs are failures. All of God's programs are total successes. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you pastors, keep preaching the word. Just keep preaching the word at your church. I'm so thankful for the pastors who are here tonight with such a heart for God, wanting to be used of the Lord, wanting our communities to be pure before the Lord. You know, I believe God can send a revival so big that this world's never seen anything bigger. I believe He can do it right now. I've got several of my preacher friends who believe that America's right at the tipping point. Either revival or ruin. That's where we really are. But if, if our nation will turn to the Lord, <laughs> if God could send revival to Nineveh, He can send revival here, a great awakening here to America. Oh, Lord, thank You for what You gave us from the Bible tonight. All these scriptures that we heard and listened to and thought and meditate on now. May all of us be pure in these sections of our lives, our body, our mind, and our behavior, our conduct. May we all be filled with the Holy Spirit. That's what we need. And led of God. Thank you. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Look this way. Sing with me. Give me that old time religion. Give me that old time religion. Give me that old time religion. It's good enough for me. It was good for the Hebrew children. It was good for the Hebrew children. It was good for the Hebrew children. It's good enough for me. Give me that old time religion. Give me that old time religion. Give me that old time religion. It's good enough for me. I hope you'll get some of these CDs, give away to your people, all that sort of thing, because I'll tell you, Christian homes ought to have Christian music in them. And our people, they're very tempted to listen to the wrong kind of music. So I think we need to be proactive. You know, when you give away...
prizes and gifts at your church. Give away spiritual things. Give away Bibles. Give away good books. And uh, give away music and so forth. And make sure the children at the church, that they hear good music and these Bible stories for kids. Oh, I, my goal is to get all the children in America to know about the Lord. You see, 92% of Americans' public school children, 92%, 51 million out of 56 million, 51 million American boys and girls in the public school didn't go to church one time last year. Not to a Baptist church, not to a Lutheran church, not to any church. Our children know almost nothing about the Bible. We got to change that. <laughs> and so do what you can in your part of the world. I'm going to try to do what I can. Pastor, thank you so much, sir. Amen. I think we want to Amen. be proactive about it. Yeah. Lord, would you continue to guide and direct us in our individual lives, our families' lives, individual local churches you have placed us in. Because a dirty world needs to see a pure heart. Yes. And we need to see you clearly, Lord. Would you, would you guide in this tonight? I pray. For each person as they travel home tonight, you give safety. You'd help us to think upon these things that we've heard, that you might be honored and glorified. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Until we meet again, take time to know the Lord and make him known. May the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. God bless.